I really didn't want to have a time when I, I kind of reviewed um, what happened last February 19th. Uh, I, I thought about um, not doing something like this, but I've had s- several people that have asked me if I would kind of tell the story. Um, I had several people uh, who, when I said I didn't want to do that, uh, kind of corrected me and said that, that uh, ultimately the hero of this story is God. Um, and I need to take any opportunity that I can to honor Him and glorify Him. And so, uh, just to begin, I, uh, the Thursday before, uh, on February 18th, uh, I felt fine. I, I didn't have any symptoms that anything was going on. Uh, I had a full day here at the church. Normally, Thursdays is when I try to, to have most of my counseling, uh, so that that's on one day. Um, it's also the day that I normally try to button up my notes for the sermon, so I finished up with my sermon notes. I met with several people in counseling. Uh, we, I left the church about 6 o'clock, and um, Emily and I went to the gym. Uh, I uh, biked for six miles and then went and ran for three. Um, and then while I was running, I get a text from Joe Cothran because he had called and asked if I would wanted some uh, cabbage stew. Uh, and I had forgotten. And so it's 8 o'clock-ish. And so we uh, left the gym and went to Beth and Joe's house. And uh, I, we walk in the door. And I normally, because I have acid reflux really bad, don't eat anything after about 6, 6.30 and so I didn't want to be rude, though, and I kind of have a personal principle of people trump programs. And so Beth said, hey, let me make you a bowl. And I'm like, all right, just a small bowl. And so Beth's definition of a small bowl was giving me this bathtub of cabbage stew. And so uh, A, to be polite, and B, because it was really good, I ate all of it and, uh, with some cornbread. And um, so got home and shockingly had real bad acid reflux. And it kept me up. All night. In fact, um, I got tired of getting up and going and getting tums, so I just grabbed a handful and put them beside the bed so that uh, if I dozed off for a little bit and then woke up, uh, I, I could just grab some tums. And uh, that morning, when uh, normally I'm off on Fridays, uh, and so that morning when Ann got up, I, I went ahead and got up, and uh, she said, "What's the matter? What's going on?" I'm just, I just uh, eating that stew right before I went to bed. I, I've been up all night with acid reflux, and she left to go to work. Um, I was starting to realize it wasn't just acid reflux, because now I'm not only feeling uh, that normal kind of chest pressure that acid reflux gives those of you that deal with it, but it's, I'm starting to feel pain running down my arm. Um, I'm, uh, Ann, in fact, and Emily got my phone and looked, and, and I w- had Googled, like, what does it feel like to have a heart attack? What are the difference between heart attack and acid reflux? And so, uh, I, and I, I just felt weird. There was something in the back of my mind that kept saying, this, this is not right. This is different. And so, I texted uh, Richard uh, and said, hey, are you at the fire hall today? Uh, and he said, yes. And I said, well, I, um, I think I'm having a heart attack. And he said, well, where are you at? And so, I I went, got in the truck, um, and started down toward 431 going to the fire department, and by the time I got to the bottom of the hill there by the retirement center and all that stuff, my chest and arm were hurting so bad I couldn't steer. So I was having to, I knee steered, and and instead of going down 431, I went across and went down that that back uh, main street and went to the fire hall, got out of the truck, um, and uh, w- walked in, and David Devine was standing there, and he's like, he looked at me kind of funny. He said, what's up with you? And I said, dude, I don't know. I th- I, I, something's going on. I think I may be having a heart attack. And he said, you're not having a heart attack. It's good a shape as you're in. Gallbladder pain feels a lot like a heart attack. That's probably what's going on. And so right as you walk in the fire department, there's, there's some chairs, and then there's a little conference room. And I sat down in those chairs, and my last memory uh, of that day was um, standing up and saying, um, no, something, so this is not right. I mean, this is hurting bad. And I, I normally have a pretty high threshold for pain. And I was, it, was, it was beyond uncomfortable. If, uh, now, 
um, JR came and got Anne from the church and brought her to the fire hall, and I do not remember her being there at all. Uh, we had multiple conversations, she said. We talked about, you know, how it was hurting, uh, what was going on, what I felt like. She said that I, I, I was throwing up, uh, that my blood pressure was going up and down. I don't remember any of, of that. In fact, my memories are that um, of me saying, man, I, I, this is hurting like nothing I've ever had. And then my next conscious memory was Anne talking to me. I thought we were at the fire hall. I found out that we were at the hospital, um, and they were about to take me up for the, um, the stent. Uh, but she said, um, baby, it's going to be okay. Uh, you're going to go home. Now, I heard uh, you're dead. You're going to go home to me. And the reason I heard that was because... Um, Multiple times in ICUs, in someone's living room, as they're in hospice, I've looked at someone as I held their hand and said, it's okay to go home. You don't have to keep fighting. And so that's kind of what I heard. Now, she was saying, it's going to be okay. We got you to the hospital. You're still alive. They're going to put a stent in, and we're going to go back to 415 Stonehenge Circle. And so I guess Ann and I have laughed at, We've been married for 29 years, and we still can't communicate. So um, I don't have any memory of that time in between, and so I have to tell you what other people have told me from that time. Um, Ann says that I was talking with them. I, I didn't seem to be particularly exercised other than the pain, and she says my eyes rolled back in my head, and then I fell out of the chair, um, J.R. and Ben were there, uh, and they caught me so that I didn't just collapse on the floor, and I, that was the first time that I flatlined. Um, I've been told that they had to shock me uh, six different times, that, that I died multiple times where I'd flatline, and I've had multiple people tell me that they were really, uh, it was really weird because I would go from um, being dead to talking to them as if nothing was going on or complaining because, hey, that hurt or get this machine off of me. Thankfully, uh, our fire department here has a machine that's called a Lucas, which is essentially a big iron or steel rod that does CPR compressions so that a person isn't doing them. And so they had me on the Lucas machine um, that was doing the compressions, and apparently when I would come to... Uh, I would complain because it's pumping pretty hard on your chest and it hurt. Um, and so I would be telling them um, to, to get this machine off of me. I will say that uh, what I've been told is the particular blockage that I had, um, normally speaking, uh, it, about 7% of people who have that kind of blockage survive. And of those, about half of those who survive um, have mental issues because, because they have a long period of time with no oxygen to the brain. The way the doctor described it to Ann is, is that once that lower descending aorta is, is blocked, the left side of the heart is, the word that he used was amputated because it just, the heart doesn't work. And so you're not getting any blood to the brain. So God had... Uh, the exact right people at the fire hall that knew that it was important to keep me under the Lucas so that I was getting blood flow, oxygenated blood, to my brain. Um, they got me to the, the ER, uh, and again, I, I'm very thankful for our volunteer fire department here, Richard Johnson, David Devine, uh, JR w- was involved, Ben Huff came in and apparently... Uh, one of the things that I was doing was I would flex up um, so that it appeared to them like I was almost in rigor mortis. I was flexing up so hard that I ended up breaking one of my molars, um, and I bit my tongue in two um, just from seizing seizing up. Um, and Ben stayed there with me and tried to calm me down when that would happen. Um, once they got me to the hospital... Um, and they were able to figure out what was going on. They cut my clothes off, were cutting my clothes off, 
and apparently I complained because I, I have a, uh, a belt that's made for concealed carry, and I was like, don't cut my belt. Um, and they, they said, well, we've we got to get, get you up there. And I'm like, dude, this is like a $100 belt. Let me, I, I can get it off. It's not that big a deal. And David Devine said that he helped me, and I got it off and said something like, now, see, it wasn't that hard, was it? And so uh, Richard came out and told everybody because apparently one of the concerns was was that had I gone a period of time without oxygen to the brain, and Richard told everybody, hey, he's going to be fine because he's being a pain in the rear, um, which is my normal modus operandi. I can bring you back, though, to, to uh, after they did the stint, I've been told that I, uh, I coded once before they got the stint in and then once when they got me to the ICU. Um, they put a pump in my heart uh, to keep my heart, the heart flowing, and that allows the heart to kind of recover uh, from all of those, the stuff that's going on, and they put a stent in that, uh, that aorta. Um, I've been told by several people, and Mark is here, and he can, I'm sure, attest to, to, to the fact that I was a horrible patient, even under sedation. Um, I've been told that I that once the nurse came in while I was sedated and I had shifted so that my feet were on the ground, I was ready to go, um, ready to get out of there. I've been told that I actually bit through the intubation tube multiple times because I was trying to get it, get it out. I do know that when I, when I came to, I had um, bruising on both my wrist and ankles, so they had me um, strapped down so that I, I, I couldn't. And I remember one time... One of my earliest memories of coming to in the ICU was a guy walked by me and I grabbed him by the neck and was mad because I didn't have the strength to close my hand. And he just kind of laughed at me and he's like, you know, really? You're going to do this? Because I just didn't have any strength at all. Uh, and I was absolutely convinced in the ICU that they were, going, they were trying to kill me. Um, I, I have since found out and read a lot about something that's called ICU psychosis. Um, and it's a combination of the the medications, the, the, the fact that people are doing things to you and you're kind of out of control, um, and um, just the constant noise and the fact that you're cut off from communication with other people, all those things combined. Um, and I, I swear, I just knew they were trying to kill me. In fact, Mark uh, came in to, to the room the day that I came out of sedation after being under for four days, and he said to me... Um, do you trust me? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, don't worry about what they're doing. I'm telling you they're here to help you. Trust me. Because I just knew that, that what they had done, uh, they, were, they were trying to kill me. And so I was a horrible patient. I told Cindy, uh, Christy Bobo that I was disappointed in her as her pastor because she was in here letting them try to kill me. Um, so I was out of my head. I, um, and I was that way until they got me into a regular room. On Tuesday, uh, Ann says that from the moment that I, uh, they, they, um, they moved me out of the room, that it was like a night and day difference immediately once I got into a, a regular room. And they wasn't going to move me, would not have moved me, had she not been able to, to stay in the room with me. Um, and so um, once I got to a normal room, my recovery seemed to move very quickly uh, the, the doctors and the nurses were all surprised that, that uh, I went from uh, the first day in a regular room, I was able to, to really take one step to uh, three days later, I was released because I could walk. I mean, that we, we walked her up and down the halls, and I went up and down some stairs, and um, they, were, they, they, they were able to release me. So um, here's what I, I know. You know, my, my whole life seems to have been, um, or seems to be, I'm where I'm not supposed to be, and God has absolutely got His hand all over it. And I, I don't think, you know, I, the, one of the doctors told Ann that, that if it wasn't for the fact that I was running and, and was in good shape, that I would have died and that uh, I would have died 10 years earlier. Um, and I, well, I understand what he's saying, and I understand that uh, 
as I'm trying to relearn how to eat, that what we do and what we, we, we choose to do has a huge impact on uh, their consequences for actions. Um, if, I, if I smoke my whole life, I can't be shocked if, if I have lung problems because there are consequences to that. So that's on one side, the responsibility of man. But on the other side, um, I, I really thought a lot about uh, the story of Satan and Job. Uh, Satan and God over Job, where God says to Satan, you can go this far, but no further. And I have no doubt in my mind that um, I was really close to February 19th being what's inscribed on my headstone. And the only thing that saved me wasn't me running or, or what's, what kept me alive was the fact that God wanted me to be alive. And he's sovereign. And sovereign means he does what he wants to do. And so I... Uh, now... I'm asking myself, why? What, what is it that God has for me? And I don't want to be uh, someone that you know falls off the deep end and, and I... I don't want to, uh, I, I want to be invested in God's Word enough to where I, I, every day I wake up and say, this is a day that's a gift. I should have died on February 19th. So what am I going to do today to make the most of that? And if we really think about it, aren't we all kind of in that position? I mean, as I have, because I'm a guy who's got to know whys, right? So I, I've read a bunch of peer-reviewed studies on different aspects of this heart attack. And it just amazes me how many things have to be in place for every heartbeat. I mean, the electrical system going across the heart the way that it does so that it, it squeezes down at a certain point and the blood comes rushing in and then it opens up and just all of that happening in a perfect sequence and perfect timing so that we don't even realize it happens that every heartbeat that we have is a gift from God. And so I hope that maybe as a church we all can use this as an opportunity to say um, every day that all of us have is a gift. That we, we shouldn't be dealing with this. We, I mean, we should have all fallen dead in the garden when God said if the moment that you eat of the tree you will surely die. We shouldn't be here. Every day is a gift. Every breath is a grace. The other thing that I, I, I want, I, 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 I would say a lot of people, I, I'm not even going to venture for a number, a lot of people have said to me, um, so did you see anything? Did you, did you have any heaven tourism? I mean, did you walk around with Jesus and he say, all right, um, you need to go back. And I, 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 I didn't. Uh, my memories go from being in the fire hall and telling me it's okay to die. <laughs> um, and then coming to Monday thinking that everybody was trying to kill me and angry because I thought I was going to die. I remember consciously thinking I was supposed to die. Why am I here? Because this ain't heaven. And I don't know if you've ever been in the SICU at Gadsden Regional. It ain't heaven. And so I'm like, if this is heaven, I, I got gypped hard. Um, so if I were to stand in front of you and say, okay, so that, that's my memory. I don't have any recollection of anything happening there. But if I had come in and said, okay, I saw the streets of gold and I saw this or that or the other thing, everybody would go, well, maybe that was the medicine or maybe that was this thing or that thing. You don't need that. We've got in the book of Revelation, you want to know what heaven looks like? It tells you. Word for word, it tells you. You want to know what Jesus looks like? It tells you. I mean, it gives a perfect description of Jesus. Now, let me, I'm going to want to read you that because Ann and I, uh, one of the things when I did come out of sedation that um, was kind of strange was is that I wanted to read this text over and over again uh, to read about 
who this Jesus is. So in Revelation chapter 1, John sees Jesus and he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see. Okay, so it says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. So he just looked like a guy who had a father. So first thing he says, it's a guy who just, he just looks like a guy. He's a man. He looks like the son of man. He's clothed with a long robe and with a gold sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow. So the description of him says that here's these guys. So he's two thousand. We think of Jesus as thirty three, right? All the pictures that we see of him in the Baptist church, he's he's got that flock of seagulls hairdo with you know blonde hair, blue eyes. Okay, first of all, Jesus was a Jew, so he would have had brown hair, olive skin, brown brown eyes. But he's two thousand years old now. Now his body's not affected by sin, so he wouldn't. But but he's still two thousand years old, so his hair is white. In fact, the kind of the, it says that it's long hair, he's got a long beard, and it's white like snow. So we've got a good description of what he looks like here. You want to know what heaven looks like? You go to the end of the book. It tells you. So you don't need somebody who's been a tourist to heaven. We know. We know. And so what I do want all believers to understand is this. When you do die... One of the things that, for me, that I do remember when I remember hurting was that sense of panic and that sense of what the heck is going on here? Why can't I breathe? Why is my chest feeling like it's being ripped apart? That panic and that, that just, I want to live. There's just something that God put inside of us that screams out, I want to live. For a believer, when you die, if you could just imagine that confusion over why can't I breathe? Why is my chest hurting? Why are all these things happening? Giving way to that confusion, now realization. And you're not alone. The Bible says in Luke 16, And Lazarus also died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. He had people with him. He had angels that were waiting. And now, instead of looking through, you know, when Paul says it's like we're looking in a glass dimly, he's talking about a piece of metal that's been polished. And so think of a distorted mirror. You can kind of make things out. You know where eyeballs are, and you maybe can kind of figure out, okay, my hair looks okay, I guess. The difference between that and looking in somebody face to face. And so now the bits and pieces that we put together, and now all of a sudden it all makes sense. And I, I think of that old hymn, just think of looking on shore and calling it heaven. Of touching a hand and finding it's God's of breathing new air and finding it celestial. That will be glory, glory for me. And so, if I were to have some recollection or some memory, you would have questions in your mind. Well, is that medicine? Was that, with, you know, he saw bright lights. And In fact, one of the things that I don't remember, but I have had, I wouldn't call it even a nightmare, but in my dreams, I've had this in the middle of a dream. You know, I'm dreaming about me shopping for strawberries at Aldi's or some crazy dream like we all have, and all of a sudden just bright flashes of light. And the only thing I can think of is that probably me recalling what it felt like to be shocked. Um, If I, if I, you, you would think those sort of things. We don't have to ask that question from the stuff that's written down in the book. We know. We know. And so, for those of all of us who've lost people that we love, and we wonder what was it like to take that step, for those of us who, um, you know, I get, I, I've been asked multiple times, what's the hardest thing afterwards? And I would say it's the mental side. 
Um, I've never in my life struggled with depression. I've never, when people, I, I know what the concept means. Um, but uh, I understand why people who have had a heart attack, their suicide rate almost triples. Because it, it's, it's, the depression that follows a near death experience is very, difficult to deal with. And I don't know if it's the medication, I don't know if it's the enemy, but sometimes some of the thoughts that just pop into my head. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I was at Agnes's funeral, and uh, that was two weeks after I'd gotten out of, the, out of the hospital, and I put my best suit on, and I'm preaching her funeral. And all of a sudden, this thought just comes into my head. These are the clothes you would have been buried in. And I'm middle of preaching her funeral, and it was almost crippling. Those kind of things, um, I, I'm finding now that, in theory, when I've talked about running to God's Word as a balm, now I'm parking in the book of Psalms. In fact, um, the other day, I was just particularly feeling down, and I got, um, I, I planned to, to read through 10, 15 Psalms, and I got to Psalm 3 and never got past it. And I'll close with this. Oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Selah. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save my soul, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek, and you break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to your Lord and your blessings on your people. Selah. Father God, Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that we can run to your word. Lord, we can trust your word. We can lean hard on you and the word that you've given us. I thank you for Hebrews 1.1 in times past. You spoke through prophets. But in these latter days, you have spoken to us through a son. Lord, I thank you that you spoke. And I thank you that you gave us your son. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you allowed me to have this heart attack. I thank you with how it's changed my perspective and made me a better pastor. I thank you that you let me live. I thank you for each and every person on the fire department and the police department and the doctors and the nurses and the flu botanist and the security guys and everybody that you put in place there to minister to me. God, I thank you for a wife who got up every morning at 4 o'clock and called before shift change and then called again and then was there by my side, who was faithful and loyal. Thank you, God, for giving me my wife. God, I thank you for my kids who loved me, who prayed and cried out to God and were there. God, I thank you for a church that rallied around me and called their friends and neighbors. I thank you for everywhere all over this city, people who have come up to me who I didn't even recognize and said, hey man, I've been praying for you. How you feeling? God, I thank you for the opportunity tonight to make much of you. You are my God, my salvation, and whom I trust. Lord, I praise you, I thank you, and I love you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Go serve your king.